This ship could fly. What happened to the plane view? In 1969, war gave birth to the U.S. Navy's newest extreme vessel. A ship that does not only float on water, rather it lifts itself right out of it. And because of this, it can do what no other ship ever can move at an unbelievable speed and operate in the toughest of conditions. This is the story of an extraordinary ship that could fly. The Relentless Soviets After World War II in the 1960s, despite the U.S. Navy being the most capable in the world, still military strategists were growing concerned about a new threat from the Soviet Union. Their nuclear-powered submarines were becoming stealthier, faster, and ever more capable. One fluff could lead to unimaginable damage. With their speed up to 41 knots fully submerged, they could easily hunt down any ship in the U.S. fleet, even outrun torpedoes. They were also capable of diving to extreme depths, making them insanely difficult to intercept. With this, they could easily shadow American, rather slow carriers, and launch a damaging strike whenever. Heavy ships like destroyers and carriers may use sonar technology to detect the attack, but there was no way they could intercept or engage. So how are Americans going to deal with increasing Soviet dominance? Something had to be done, and it had to be quick. A new idea, a new machine something faster, reliable, and deadlier. This gave birth to the humble beginnings of the exceptional plain view. The Resilient Americans Honestly, launching an ambitious project was nothing new for the U.S. because back in the 1920s, a similar project was taken forward, when after World War I, the strategists realized the importance of dominant water control. At this time, having a strong Navy force had become an invincible requirement, but neither ship nor planes could fully solve the problem. Moreover, aircraft technologies were not efficient enough to support longer flight routes. Engines burnt excessive fuels, and attaching even bigger tanks was never going to work, because it was obvious that engines were going to collapse. And also, who wanted pokey planes? So, in desperation, they needed new thinking, an equipment which could be as functional from the ocean as it would have been from the sky. This pinched an idea. How about making a detrimental plane that could land and take off from the ocean? Something which is not bound to a runway. This had changed everything. It nurtured a new dream, and engineers started building an amphibious plane known as PB-2Y Coronado. By the end of 1930s, war was imminent on both parts of the world, and the production of this reliable petrol bomber, U.S. tried their best to prepare for the war. And when the time had come, stalwart Coronado proved to be a ferocious and deciding factor. Similarly, the desire to fight Soviets and take back Navy dominance gave birth to the excruciating need for a much more deterrent, bigger, and faster ship craft. Eventually, they turned to a technology which was already 50 years old, one step forward of building an unbelievable machine. The Quest for Design Back in 1906, an Italian inventor, Enrico Orleani, invented a boat that used underwater wings, and his boat was lifted as it accelerated, exponentially reducing the amount of drag and letting the boat hover and move with much faster speed. This design was further improved in the coming decades, allowing it to drastically improve in all of its aspects. But Americans were least interested in getting invested in this technology because it could only reach 75 miles per hour. And also, it worked fine on calmer waters. But as soon as it had to face disturbing waves, it made a huge shaking. So the only way to work this out was to change the design. So the new hydrofoil design had to be faster and bigger, and they did it. However, it had also made it unstable, 
and the foil had to be continuously adjusted. It was time when the US finally came to realize that this could really be the answer to the Soviets' ordeal, with their speed and capacity to fly through virtually any condition made them perfect to engage in warfare. Who would have thought that the dream of Italian origins will one day become one of the most extraordinary machines ever? However, beside the perfect solution, making it a reality was still a challenge. The dream was still far away. From 1950 onwards, it took 14 years of testing, and at last, in the spring of 1964, the Lockheed Shipbuilding and Construction Company finally had achieved the impossible and made the largest hydrofoil, the USS Plainview, known to be the Flying Boat. By the 1970s, the U.S. Navy had four exquisite hydrofoil prototypes ready to be commissioned in the seas. With two monstrous flying ships, 110 tons USS High Point and the largest in the world, 320 ton plane view. With this capacity, they would be raging all over the world. And that's not all, because on drawing boards, they had even more ambitious plans. Building 2,500 ton flying ships, those gigantic destroyer sized hydrofoils, which will not only embark with their unhead speed, but are also large enough to be equipped with even helicopters. A dream to build a warfare monster. But before any of this came to reality, prototype ships had to go through rigorous evaluation, foil configuration, and their propulsion system and much more. Being trialed and tested was absolutely critical because they were expected to operate in the most rigorous weather conditions, from sea storms to cold waters. Will they be able to pass it? Everyone with their bets on waited how they performed. But it wasn't easy at all. For a project as special and new as this, there were no definite parameters for it to test. But when tested, along with technical and structural issues, Marinized gas turbines provide the power required to keep the ship foil borne. Over time, through further development and refinements, engineers overcame the challenges to craft the one perfect vessel. Yet with the newness of the technology, it constantly drew skepticism. Sadly, the margin for error was a way too short for this incredible beginning. Rising above the failures. But with every development, it got better and better. And now it was drawing a fading line between Navy and aviation. Because now, after being equipped with modern artillery, it could not only fly, but also it could target and destroy objects through unheard distances. Using guns while moving at a relentless speed, launching torpedoes, and bombarding anti-ship and anti-aircraft missiles. With time, it was gradually becoming a deadly weapon and a project with unrealized potential. The Most Awaited Dawn by 1969, all the struggle had paid off. Now, at Holborn speeds, plain view was full of surprises. It could not only operate much like a conventional ship powered by a pair of 600 horsepower diesel engines, but when needed, it could hydraulically lower down its foils, and then it's about seeing a flying ship with 14,000 horsepower gas turbines. Its mechanism was extremely complex, but totally worth it. Two jet engines transferred power through a transmission system to ignite super-captivating titanium propellers, and that would fly it away at over unimaginable 50 knots. And that's not all, because future upgradation would allow it to have an extra jet propeller, which would take it to an unbelievable 90 knots. This version was highly developed, as previously occurring limitations like continuous foil adjustments were now resolved and this time, it had a fully functional automatic control system that regularly adjusted its angles to maintain stability, even under 10-foot waves. But just like any other story, there is no ending without a tragedy. The tragedy awaits. 
By 1969, because of numerous institutional reasons, the ship was already three years behind schedule, and it topped the budget by 100%. At that point, the Navy decided to overtake the project and try to work out the issues. But it wasn't as easy as it seemed. Each of the four prototypes were the most unique technologies ever, and they needed highly trained insight and military accountancy wasn't really genius developers who could understand. It took another two years, and now, in May 1974, the officials sent Plainview to dry dock for further upgrades. It included enhancements of a more refined hydraulic system and an advanced digital autopilot. After these developments, Plainview was a better ship. But for all of its massive advantages, it carried some critical drawbacks, too. Compared to traditional warships, it was way too heavy, and being equipped with aluminum fossils went against it. Those were neither as strong nor cost-effective to be built. Weight limitations also meant they were going to be less armored equipped. And that's not all. By the 1970s, military strategists now had more practical alternatives. Their aircrafts had become even more powerful, and now could attack any submarine underwater. With much more cost efficiency and exquisite precision, it was never going to be encouraging news for Plainview. And at last, by late 1970s, its production was sealed, and the magnificent story of creating something unbelievable came to a halt. And that's the tale of a flying ship. They may not be in production right now, but now having to know their wonderful story, from Grumman Corporation winning the bid for design in 1961 to the first high-speed test in 1968, this was the story of determination, innovation, and passion. See you next time.